next speaker in this session is uh, Howard Strobin from Boston College, who will, telling me, who will be telling us about the expressive power of two-variable logic. Well, thank you. I'd like to thank the organizers for the kind invitation. This has forced me to uh, actually calculate and say aloud how many years ago I was a graduate student here, but uh, um, it's okay. <laughs> a lot. Um, so uh, this talk lives in first order logic on words, interpreting words over a finite alphabet. Um, there is this uh, one relation less than that lets you say that one position is to the left of another. Um, and using this, you can define properties of words, you can define languages. So for example, this one here, this sentence, says that there's two positions. Um, there's a letter A in both of those positions. And this part here says that there's no position strictly between them. So you put it together. This sentence defines a regular language. If you think of the input alphabet as A, B, um, this sentence defines a regular language consisting of all the words that have two consecutive A's. And just some uh, um, facts about what you can do in this logic. I'm, I'm, I'm concentrating on one kind of result here, so not things like uh, the complexity of um, <coughs> deciding if a, if a formula is true. Um, but just uh, to start off with, every language that you can define in this logic, of course, is a regular language. Um, there is an alternative equivalent characterization in terms of temporal logic. Everything that you can define here is, uh, uh, um, these are exactly the languages definable in linear propositional temporal logic. Um, there is a hierarchy within this based on alternation of quantifiers, and that hierarchy is infinite. <coughs> that means that for um, every k, um, as long as the alphabet has at least two letters, um, for every k, um, there are um, languages here of arbitrarily large alternation depth. They're outside of sigma k. Um, and the kind of result that I'm going to concentrate on the most, um, oh, there it is, it, no, what, is, is this one that you can, um, decide whether um, a given regular language, say it's given by a regular expression, given by a finite automaton, is definable in this logic. This is a result, an old result from the 1960s due to Schutzenberg's day. And this is, the, this is the kind of result that I'm most interested in this, for in this talk. So for first order logic, um, uh, to give you the example, these algebraic decision procedures are based on the syntactic monoid of the language. What you do is you uh, um, uh, construct the uh, um, minimal DFA for the language, and you look at the transitions on the set of states that are induced by the words. Um, this forms a finite semigroup, a finite monoid, because it has an identity um, under composition. <coughs> and for the example that we saw before, the set of words that contain two consecutive A's, um, if you tabulate it, you'll find out that there are actually exactly six elements here. and. Um, uh, these equations, by the way, completely determine the multiplication of words in this <coughs> monoid. And a language is definable um, in first order logic um, if and only if this monoid contains no non trivial groups. That's uh, Schutzenberger's result. Um, equivalent way to say this, the word for this is that the monoid is aperiodic. Um, you can also express this in terms of identities. I'll use this symbol a lot. Um, inside a finite semigroup, um, <coughs> every element has a power that's an idempotent. There's a unique idempotent among the powers of x. And we'll denote that by x, x to the omega. Um, so another way to say that the monoid is aperiodic is that um, it satisfies this equation. In the particular case of this one example, um, this uh, collapses to x cubed equals x squared for every x in the monoid. <coughs> so this is a sort of game that I'm going to play with the two variable fragment. Um, you get these equations, and the way to tell whether or not a language is definable in this logic is to do this kind of computation in the finite semigroup. Okay, so um, in uh, first order logic with this less than relation, um, every sentence is equivalent to one that uses only three variables. You can reuse the variables. This result was actually um, appears in Kemp's work on propositional, on linear temporal logic because in translating from temporal logic into first order logic, this found that you only need three variables. So a different proof by Emmerman and Cozen that uses uh, model theoretic techniques, I think model theoretic games. Um, and we'll do this to note by, <coughs> with this uh, superscript two, the fragment consisting of formulas where you only use two variables. And for example, to see how this works, um, I always get these wrong, so I think I checked this, is that um, this is a set of words over the alphabet A, B um, that um, the letter 
immediately after the first A is also an A. <coughs> so it contains an A, and right after that there's an A. And you can say this with two variables by saying there's a position that contains an A somewhere to the left of it, somewhere to the left of it there's an A. Um, and furthermore, um, for every Y to the left of it that's a B, everything to the left of that is also a B. In other words, there can't be any Bs between these uh, um, two A's. So there's no direct way to say in this logic that one position is strictly between another, one position is a successor of another, but you can sort of sneak up on it for this example. On the other hand, our original example of the set of words that contain two consecutive A's, um, this cannot be defined in this logic, and we'll, uh, <coughs> we'll see why in a moment. So, um, this is uh, not advancing for me. It was working uh, before when I, isn't it the one on the right? All right, so let's see. Do I have to do this the old fashioned way at the computer or the? Is the button on? Oh, no, now it's working again. Oh, did you do that or did I do it? I did it. So, okay. So <laughs> All right, good. This is, this is right. This is right. Yeah, no, I, I had that. I, maybe I wasn't yeah. just like leaning Sorry. on it hard enough. Thank you. Um, <coughs> the, uh, um, so here's some facts about this. This is mostly from um, papers by most of this, from papers by Etasami, Vardy, Vilka, and Terry, and not all the same paper. There's a, a few of them. One is that um, as for full first order logic with the less than relation, um, this has an alternative characterization in temporal logic where you just have these future and past modalities. Um, uh, this is a formula that denotes the same example that I had before. And there's a lot of other characterizations in terms of Aaron Foyce games with just two pebbles, in terms of Aaron Foyce games with just one pebble because as, as long as you keep track of which direction the move was made in. Uh, things called rankers and turtle languages, not sure what those are, but what's new. Um, and also, if you look at where does this sit inside the quantifier alternation hierarchy inside the larger logic, inside um, first order where you're allowed more than two variables, um, it's actually um, all sitting down in a low level. It's inside sigma two, and in fact, it's exactly the intersection of sigma two and pi two. Um, and finally, as I say, this is the kind of result I'm most interested in. There's an algebraic decision procedure for definability. And that's that a regular language is definable in this logic if and only if, well, there's some condition on the syntactic monoid. Again, this is a more complicated condition, but that it belongs to this class uh, DA. Okay, Neil, what happened? Oh, it, it, it moved. It did move? Oh, okay. I wasn't looking. I, so the. What I have to do is not look when I press the button, and that, <laughs> that makes it go. OK, so there's many equivalent characterizations of this uh, um, class of finite monoids. Um, lots of different equations in terms of the ideal structures. The easiest thing in the easiest equation is this one, that for any two elements, x and y, this equation is satisfied. Remember that omega means the idempotent power. Um, and uh, <coughs> um, so you, know, you can just plug things into this, and you get the, the result, whether it's definable or not. So in the example that we had before of the set of words that contain two consecutive A's, if you just look at the calculation that was done before, um, replace uh, X and Y by A and B respectively, then AB, the item potent power of AB is just AB. Um, but if you um, insert an A in this, evaluate the left-hand side of that equation, you get a different element. You get the zero. <laughs> and that's the way you use this to prove that this cannot be expressed using two variables. And moreover, if it does satisfy the equation, then um, there is a way to uh, write a sentence for it. <clears throat> um, so the formula that we saw, uh, OK, so this is about alternation depth. <laughs> alternation depth I was talking about originally in terms of uh, first order logic without the restriction on variables. For it, when you restrict the number of variables, it doesn't make sense to talk about a prefix anymore um, because you're going to be reusing variables. On the other hand, it does make sense to talk about alternation depth if you like push all of the negations to the level of the atomic formulas and just count <coughs> the number of alternations of quantifiers on any path from I guess the root of the tree representing this formula down to the leaves. So in this one, there's uh, the longest path is this exists for all for all. So there's one alternation. Well, we're counting the number of blocks, not actually the number of alternations. Um, so this has uh, alternation depth two. And there's some natural questions to ask here. One is, <coughs> in this uh, restricted logic, 
is the quantifier alternation depth hierarchy infinite? And also the same kind of question that was asked before, can you actually decide this question? Can you just uh, look at the language and um, find out uh, what the exact alternation depth is? Um, and the answer um, for the first one, whether the alternation depth hierarchy is finite or infinite, is yes and no. Um, and the yes and no is this. This is a result of Weiss and Immerman. Um, there are languages of arbitrarily large alternation depth. However, if you restrict the alphabet to a fixed finite alphabet, then the alternation depth is bounded depending on the size of the alphabet. Um, I discovered with horror this morning as I was going over the talk that I had a number of off by one errors in the statement of this. I think this is the right statement. Close enough. It's close <laughs> enough, right. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's actually the way I felt about it, but I didn't want to, you know, I wanted, I wanted to get it right. But, okay. Um, the other question, um, um, which is whether you can effectively determine the exact quantifier alternation depth of a, in this hierarchy. In other words, is there uh, um, something that looks like one of these algebraic decision procedures again. By the way, you can prove by a kind of abstract nonsense argument that all of these properties really depend only on these algebraic invariants. They only depend on the syntactic monoid, but it's another story to find out <coughs> exact equations and the like. So the answer here is yes. And this is from a few years ago, 2013 maybe. Um, and actually done, there are two completely different answers here. There's two different algebraic decision, decision procedures, different criteria, and they were discovered independently. I'll show you the one that I know. Um, <coughs> this is, uh, um, and it actually is a system of equations. So I realize this is a little bit hard to read, but um, uh, it's a sequence of um, equations, and it starts out with these using just uh, two unknowns in the equation. Um, U1 equals V1, where um, U1 and V1 are defined this way. And then at each step, um, you introduce uh, two new variables um, and build these new words, U sub n plus 1 and V sub n plus 1 over U sub n and V sub n. And in this way, um, you get this uh, whole big sequence of equations. Um, and a language is definable in two variable logic with quantifier depth less than or equal to n if and only if the uh, syntactic monad is aperiodic, and that means it has no non-trivial groups inside, um, and it satisfies this equation, u sub n equals v sub n. And um, uh, just in contrast, so that gives a, a nice criterion for this. The analogous problem for um, quantifier alternation depth, if you don't have this variable restriction, is a very long open problem. There was this recent breakthrough just a few years ago by Plas and Zaytun that decides membership in sigma <coughs> three and the Boolean closure sigma two. I think there's also an argument for sigma four, but this is a very difficult, uh, much more difficult than um, <coughs> what's um, done for the two variable logic and still an open problem for the uh, other levels. <laughs> okay. All right, let's see. Uh, okay. I, I don't know. It's just uh, maybe I'm holding it some funny way. You have the magic. I just had you do this, you know. That's Next slide, please. Yeah, right. It's like the page turner for the piano player. Yeah, when, when we use the more reliable. Okay. Question? Question? Yes. Is that equation un equals vn, is that decidable? Or the sure, and the reason it's decidable is this. It's just explicit. If you have the, mul for any of these equations, if you have the multiplication table of the monoid written down, you just plug in values. I mean, in principle, you have to try out all combinations of values, but it's definitely decidable, and it's, uh, you can even bound the complexity for something uh, not too unreasonable there as well. <laughs> this one's not working either. Okay, well, um, I, can, I can just do it the old-fashioned way. Just use the arrow keys. Uh, yeah. Okay, <laughs> so um, <clears throat> those equations actually give another proof of the strictness of the hierarchy, um, just to show you what an argument like this would look like. Um, so you define a, a congruence on, uh, on A star and the set of words over A. Um, the definition is a little bit fussy to write down the whole thing correctly, but just in a nutshell, don't read all this. Uh, here's the way it works. You look at the word, you read it from left to right, and look at the first occurrence of the last letter to occur. So in this case, the letters in the word are A, B, and C, um, and you, when you read from left to right, um, the last occurrence is, um, the first occurrence of the last letter to appear is the C, and the prefix is B, A, A, B. You read from the right to the left, and the last 
The first occurrence of the last letter to appear when you read in this direction is the B. Um, so you get the C here, this prefix, the B here, this suffix. And you say that two words are equivalent if these quadruples map up in the following sense, that you get the same letter here and here, and that the corresponding prefixes and suffixes are also congruent. Um, and the reason this actually works as a, it's a recursive definition, it reads by induction on the size of the alphabet. So this defines a congruence, for example, for words over a three-letter alphabet. In terms of a two-letter alphabet, <coughs> the induction starts at zero. So that's the congruence. Um, and the quotient by this congruence, this is actually a well-known construction. Um, this is the free idempotent monoid on A. It's high, every element in it is an idempotent, so it satisfies this identity here. And using that, <coughs> it's actually pretty easy in terms of the description of the congruence um, <coughs> to uh, um, show that each congruence class is defined by a two-variable formula, and the alternation depth is equal to the size of the alphabet. Um, and um, furthermore, if you look at the equations we have for characterizing alternation depth, since everything is idempotent in this monoid, all those omegas go away, um, and u1 and v1 then look like this, and you see these two words are not congruent over this two-letter alphabet x1, x2, because here x1 is the first letter to appear, um, and here x2 is the first letter to appear. Um, and as you go up the scale, you find that the words corresponding to u2 and v2 are not congruent um, over um, a four-letter alphabet and over a six-letter alphabet for u3 and v3. And the reason these two words are not congruent is that in both cases, the first letter to appear when you're reading from left to right is x4. Um, and then if you take that prefix, the first letter to appear reading from right to left is x3. And that would then imply that U1 has to be congruent to V1 over the smaller alphabet, and it's not. So if you have a pair that's not congruent, you build them up this way, and you get other pairs that are not. Um, and this shows that if uh, your alphabet has two N letters, then a congruence class for this congruence is not definable. And you can actually get that two N down to uh, N plus two. <coughs> Uh, by using a slightly different congruence. It's also possible using this algebraic method to um, get another proof of the other result of weiss nimmerman that this hierarchy collapses um, for a fixed finite alphabet um, A because the, if the monoid is generated by n elements, it's possible to change the equation for um, any k great, u sub k equals v sub k for any k greater than n actually implies that the equation holds for n as well. So <clears throat> I'm going to change this logic a little bit. Um, uh, I haven't said anything about this thing, that if you had a successor relation, um, you can um, define more stuff. Almost everything works the same way. There's a counterpart in temporal logic. It is bounded alternation depth with respect to um, the larger logic. There is an algebraic decision procedure for definability. The hierarchy is strict. I don't think you get the collapse result in the same way for this one. I don't know if it's different with successor, because uh, I'll just look, uh, the, I'm not sure about that, but um, what I do want to do in the last few minutes is talk about the actual new work that's here. Um, so why is, what's the difference between two variable logic and um, the full first order logic? And basically, if you try to put your finger on it, is because in two variable logic, you cannot say that one position is between two other positions. Yes, oh yeah. Um, so, what happens if you um, add a relation that says there is an A between positions X and Y? In other words, you add a, another relation uh, a with uh, two free variables like this that says um, there's some position Z strictly between X and Y that contains an A. And then um, you can define the successor relation if you do that. You can define the language we saw at the beginning of, of this uh, um, talk. And we'll use this notation, first order logic with two variables, um, but where you've added this between relation and just to give a rundown of what's here. Um, so the obvious question is, do you recover all of first order logic uh, this way? Um, the answer is no. Um, the, uh, another way to say it more positively, it's this logic is still strictly contained in there. Um, and it's, uh, um, this is an example that separates, and I'll see in a moment why that is. Um, is the quantifier alternation depth, the so-called dot depth of languages in this <coughs> logic bounded? Um, and the answer again is no, but it's sort of a qualified no, because once again, this depends on the size of the alphabet. Um, if we um, use the, as the letters of the alphabet, symbols for n and or at different depths, 
um, then, and then take the set of prefix encodings of depth and Boolean circuits um, that evaluate to true, then what you find actually is that this language has alternation depth um, larger than n. It's not in sigma n. Um, on the other hand, um, this requires the alphabet to grow. And we believe that if you fix the alphabet size, that the quantifier alternation depth in this sense is bounded. Um, but um, we've only been able to prove that for a two-letter alphabet. It's really kind of our open question. Um, and finally, yes, we do have one of these, uh, well, we have an algebraic decision <laughs> procedure, but again, it's not um, as tight a result as we'd like. It is a necessary condition <coughs> that we can compute. Um, we know this condition is sufficient for two-letter alphabets, and we're still working um, on the question about for larger alphabets. Um, so the condition is this. It's a little uh, in involved, but there's this thing called the J ordering on finite semigroups that M1 is J below M2 if M1 belongs to the two-sided ideal generated by um, M2. <coughs> and what you do is you take, uh, um, for each idempotent, you take the submonoid generated by um, uh, elements that are J above the idempotent. Then you can form a, another monoid inside the monoid, and the criterion is that this little monoid is in DA. So I'll try to wrap it up. Uh, <coughs> the, what this lets you do is do these simple calculations. For instance, um, this is the minimal DFA of this language. It's an incompletely specified uh, DFA, so it doesn't have that sync state. The elements of the monoid are these uh, um, partial functions. Um, and you just do a calculation here. You can verify that um, that condition about uh, E M sub E E is, uh, um, uh, doesn't hold um, for this because it just uh, evaluate the underlying equations. And thus, we know that this cannot be defined in the given logic. And <coughs> there is a picture here. This is a picture for um, <coughs> all alphabets. Um, uh, there would, we think there's a different picture if you restrict the finite alphabet of where these different logics lie relative to the alternation hierarchy in FO less than. I'm going to say one word, I mean, five words about uh, <coughs> the way we do this. I haven't said anything about the, here I'm going to skip these ones. Um, <coughs> I'm going to skip, uh, I didn't say anything about the proofs. But the deal here is that Showing that an equation is one of these conditions is necessary is actually kind of easy. Easy really belongs in quotes here. It's easier than the converse. Um, it's actually possible to do this with an Aaron Feuch game kind of argument. Usually we pass through something different. We start out with the uh, um, logical description and translate it into a description in terms of uh, something like semi-direct product decompositions and the like. Um, but showing sufficiency of an equation um, is usually much harder. Um, and that uh, um, seems to be a different kind of argument in each case. And that's where most of the work is involved in these things. Um, and um, so I sort of wanted to <laughs> finish by saying um, uh, I, this is not necessarily what I want to be doing, but it's all I know how to do. Um, and the, but it has to do with the limitation of this <laughs> this approach. This is actually pretty cool. This, is a, this algebraic method is a, it's a really powerful tool um, for characterizing, deciding expressive power of logics. But it only is powerful in this limited domain where there are logics on words that define only regular languages. So if you move um, that um, barrier a little bit, for instance, for regular languages of trees, there are some promising results. And I think you can even do two variable logic. Um, but um, although there is a machinery in place for doing this, it's much, much harder to squeeze interesting results out of this. Um, it will also be very interesting to try to characterize the regular languages and extensions of these logics, which let you define non-regular languages. And these are equivalent to a number of problems in circuit complexity. Again, there's going to be at least one talk about this, um, this meaning. Um, but um, uh, this is a big challenge, and these things uh, remain major challenges. OK, so I'm done. Thank you. Questions? Yes. So when you, you gave your hard example for alternation. You mentioned the frequent uh, idempotent. Yes. Model. Is there some way of making this relationship between the f idempotent and FO2 more, is there like a higher level thing? FO2 is idempotence. Uh, I'm okay. <coughs> not sure I understand the question, but e e even even so, I'll answer it. <laughs> so uh, 
Um, that congruence that's used to define the free idempotent monoid, there's a way of generalizing the congruence where you're looking at things like the second or the third appearance or something like that of a letter, and you get a whole sequence of congruences this way, and that's equivalent to DA. So that will define the whole variety that way. By, by kind of tweaking that definition, you get, uh, um, you get the whole variety. I don't know that that answers the question, but that's It was the, not a well-formed question. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but yeah, I mean, there's, a, there's sort of a generalization of that congruence that gives you the result. Other questions? Well, or ill-formed? Yes. No? Oh, well, let's thank Howard again. Thank you. Thank you.